How's it going folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. After two prequels and 10 years, the Lambert family is back front and center to continue their journey with the demonic dimension known as the Further in Insidious 5, The Red Door. And we're going to be explaining everything they're up to this time. Beware of spoilers! I think any fan of the Insidious series will agree that the first two are by far the best. The franchise has struggled a bit since James Wan moved on to bigger conjuring pastures. Three was an obvious low point. But I didn't mind the last key, especially the new creature, Keyface portrayed by the incomparable Javier Baudet. Sure, it still made money, yet it still seemed to be missing something creatively. So enter the Red Door, now with Patrick Wilson himself in the director's chair, to bring the series back to its roots of the first two films, and hopefully steer the franchise ship forward, especially as we already have an upcoming spin-off thread coming our way. The stage is set for them to finish the Lambert story in a satisfying way, while also pushing the franchise into its next iteration. However, I have to say I left the Red door a bit disappointed. Sure, it does give us some finality for the family, especially Josh and Dalton, but several aspects felt severely lacking. The trailers were all, oh, they gotta go deeper into the further than ever before to solve this one, but there was barely any featuring of the dimension or its inhabitants whatsoever. I was like, cool, we'll see the lipstick demon again and whatever, but I mean, they didn't really do much. We don't really discover anything new about any of that stuff. It's just strange how little this one decided to focus on that aspect at all. It instead chooses to to give the spotlight to Josh and Dalton's fractured relationship in the years since Insidious 2. As we remember, they were both hypnotized in order to forget the trauma they had been through after the two films, in particular Josh going nutso and attacking his family. The problem is we remember, but they don't. So much of the story is dominated by mentions of foggy memory and something going on. We're going, yeah, we already know all this. The amnesia style story does make sense, but it should have been accelerated in my opinion, because it's way too late before things are revealed. And yeah, they have that astral projection powers and all that. Anyway, as we see when we pick up with the family now, the hypnosis cure is still working in a sense. Yet the family is dealing with all kinds of new trauma, and the Lamberts have effectively been torn apart. They are first seen dealing with the fresh loss of Josh's mother, Lorraine, who was pivotal in helping them previously in the dealings with the further. Losing Lorraine is bad enough, but Josh and Renee have separated as well, creating even more distance in the family's relationships. Although most strained of all is definitely that between Josh and is now a college bound son, Dalton. Neither seems exactly sure where things went sour, but it's clear that hypnosis is no longer having the same positive effect, and continuing to deny what happened is now actually causing things to only get worse. Of course, neither Dalton or Josh are aware of what they went through 10 years ago, and it's their rediscovering of the past that consumes much of their respective arcs. Both Josh and his boy have kind of pulled away from themselves as well as in their relationship with others. No matter how much they try, there is no escaping the pool of the dark demon infested dimension known as the further and it starts to crack back into their lives and memories. This starts in a familiar face at the funeral as Josh bumps into Carl, the man who performed the hypnosis, and he seems to vaguely recognize him. Carl only admits that he knew his mother and mentions nothing of their earlier encounter. Then in his car, there's a suspicious figure dressed in brown looming behind him, but they quickly disappear before Josh notices. We'll find out more about him later, but the point is the further is already starting to worm its way back into their lives. However, it's the father-son dynamic that really takes the front seat, as Josh, after Renee's suggestion, decides to drive his boy off to school. After some deliberation, Dalton agrees, leaving Josh a little worried, but also slightly hopeful. There still could be a chance to mend things, however things don't go exactly swimmingly, with an awkward, silent car ride. And Dalton seems completely uninterested in being around his dear old dad. Some of the reason behind this becomes clear on the campus. Josh hands Dalton a flyer for a frat party, as he was in one back in in college, but Dalton isn't his father as he tells him, you obviously don't even know me. This leads to a blow up, an emotional exchange of words between the two, and they leave each other in a huff. Things now more raw than ever. Due to a contrived mistake, Dalton's new roommate, Chris, is a girl if you can believe it. She is very animated and helps to get Dalton come out of his shell, eh, at least a little bit. Also helps that she's pretty much the only person he ever interacts with. Already at this point, there is at least some part of Dalton that remembers vaguely that something happened during the coma back when he was a kid. We see this represented through his many drawings, several of which depict specific events from the first two films. Again, the past has already been seeping in after all these years. It doesn't really get kickstarted until he attends his first art class with the no-nonsense professor Armagon. To show how serious she really is, she demands one kid to tear up his drawing on the spot. He refuses and she's like, bye dude! Dang, pretty serious program here. She leads the remainder through an exercise, asking them to focus on their memories, on their past, and counts down from ten. Well, I 
Uh-oh. She inadvertently is doing the same basic kind of thing that Carl did, putting Dalton right back into that dormant astral projection state. He goes into a trance and intensely paints a picture of an ominous looking black door. Man, that's not quite right. What looks like the lipstick demon cuts his hand, spilling the blood right on the drawing. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, red. That's better. Meanwhile, Josh digs into his own memory related issues, feeling that he's been in a fog the last few years. He gets checked out at the doctor and slid into a claustrophobia inducing MRI machine. As the door is now open, things quickly get spooky and the lights go out. Josh calls out for assistance, but no one comes. Lying there trapped, an entity of a hospital patient appears and rises behind him. He goes to Josh, but ultimately nothing happens, beyond shaking Josh up pretty good. Dalton encounters something similar when he is dragged by Chris to attend the frat party after all, offering to do it for his dad. He does it anyway, and amongst the frat bros, he gets to meet the spirit of a boy who died in some kind of accident in the house. He isn't much of a threat, really, outside of blowing chunks all over Dalton, and also repeatedly urges for him to close the door. Can you guess which one he means? They each respectively dig deeper into their repressed memories, as well as venture deeper into the blue-hued, smoky void of the further dimension. And the longer that they spend in there, the more aware the ghoulies become of their presence. Thus, the things become more dangerous as well, the closer they get to unlocking their memories. For Josh, who has been staying at Lorraine's house, he has led to a previously unknown element of his past and family history. All that he ever knew about his dad is that he left back when he was a baby, and that was it. Doing memory exercises, that same brown suited fellow is looming in the front yard. Appearing there trying to show Josh something, the spirit shoves him into a closet, knocking a box labeled Ben Burton right in his lap. The clues within send him to the library, where he learns the previous unknown story of Ben, the father he never knew. It also echoes his own relationship with Dalton in some thematic ways. Turns out that he most likely had the same abilities as Josh and Dalton, which was a struggle for Ben as well. He thought taking himself out would end all the supernatural funny business, leaving a note, it ends with me. Well, no such luck there, guy. But at least he knows the truth about his dad now. He wasn't a deadbeat, but rather was struggling with the very same things he is now. Back at school, the more Dalton digs into his rediscovered astral abilities, reality and the further start becoming more blurred together. This is first seen when the lipstick demon is able to enter our world and attack Chris. It's only thanks to Dalton waking up that she is saved, severing the connection between realms. There's a brief fallout between them after this, but ultimately it's Chris that is able to figure out just what Dalton's abilities are all about. All thanks to some YouTube videos featuring our old pal Spex and Tucker, along with Elise doing a discussion on astral projection. In a way, his red door painting represents the further opening of his subconscious, and over time he fills in more details. At one point, he starts working on a terrifying figure wielding a hammer with a mad stare, which turns out to be none other than his dad. As you remember in the climax of Insidious 2, Josh was possessed and went after his family with murderous intentions. This appears to be the biggest thing Dalton is actually struggling with. That thing buried deepest in his locked up memories. He along with his siblings were just small kids when that happened, and they didn't understand the whole thing going on. All they saw was their father, not the demon behind his eyes, and that no doubt messed him up pretty good. This was of course the whole reason for the hypnosis in the first place, to bury what happened so that they could hopefully move on as a family. Well, now it's all out in the open, and Dalton even gets to relive that moment as an adult observer, him and his younger brother, along with their mother, scrambling to escape Josh's wrath. It's again this that Dalton has been struggling with the most, and is subconsciously why he is so distant with his father. Something in there still remembers that shit. Dalton gets to enjoy the feeling of being a meat suit for the bride that previously took his father in a very, very brief appearance. At the same Lambert home where he was in a coma as a child, a desperate Josh visits Renee and demands to know what he has forgotten. She lays out what we already know about the astral projecting and the attack and all that, assuming that his boy's in trouble. Josh descends into the further to rescue him once more. Kind of going a back and forth thing. I save you in one movie, you save me the next one, now it's my turn again. He finds him held prisoner in the Lipstick Demon's strange office where he puts on a familiar record. Tiny Tim's eerie take on tiptoe through the tulips. Tip Josh saves his boy, and they navigate their way out of the dimension with the demon hot on their tails. They make it past the red door without issue, but Josh is forced to stay behind to keep it shut and the demons at bay. He tells Dalton to get out of here, and he makes it back to his body. Left on his own, we hear Josh's heartbeat slow to a stop. Dalton, back in his body, frantically thinks of what to do. He haphazardly covers the door in black paint, which also appears on the door in the further. This allows Renee to pull Josh back to his body, despite fluttering briefly on the verge of death. Yet it does seem to have some interesting lingering effects. 
attacks. Outside, he encounters at least a spirit who offers some encouraging words. Although Josh doesn't remember her, there once more is some vague recollection of who she is. Things wrap up with the father and son's bond rekindled after facing their troubled history head on. That feels like much more of the takeaway of the story, and the literal demons they had to tend with are more representative of their own personal demons. Point being, I'm sure this is meant to be the conclusion of the Lambert's family story. I mean, he painted the door closed, right? That's how it works, I guess. While this may be closing the door on the Lambert's chapter in the Insidious universe, there is a short post credit scene that lets us know they're not done yet. Back at the paint splatter door, a light clicks on above, letting us know the further is definitely not sealed up for good. As we know, there is already the upcoming spinoff thread, and it sounds like it will be focused much more on the dimension based on the story, where a couple use the further, or at least some kind of black magic, to travel back in time to save a child they lost. Also in Insidious 2, there was a bit of this out of time element explored, with them spectating events from the previous film. This also happened a little bit in Red Door, with growing up Dalton reliving that moment his dad went bananas. And it sounds like Thread will focus more on further and expand it into new directions at least. Well, that's something. That'll wrap things up for now, but don't forget before we go, you can see me request for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you think of the Red Door and its ending? What's your ranking of the series? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.